Okay, so SCF minimalism. Then this is a, a concept of minimalism I got into a few years ago when I was introduced to um, a travel bag, actually. <laughs> and um, because I, it was the idea was you just, when you go travel overseas or you travel to another city, only take carry on. That was the minimalism concept. And so I bought this really fancy cool travel bag that cost in New Zealand like about $450 or something crazy. And it's just a carry-on travel bag that fits in the overhead locker of the aeroplane. And it's the idea that you only take three pairs of undies or, you know, a pair of pants, whatever it is. It's just, it's it's a minimalism um, concept. And so when I came to um, solution-focused approach, I was introduced to this idea of minimalism and in, in solution-focused as well and how we... <clears throat> shave things off like if you watch those videos at the start of insu and and steve you'll see kind of this compliments idea and and over the years compliments have kind of gone out of the sessions in some ways in many ways um the same thing with um this break they used to have a break at the end of the session go out of the room or take a moment to just look at the desk and write down some notes about some homework that you'd give so another minimalism idea was um, giving some homework um, and that's kind of gone away as well so the closing of an SF session is, is more about um, just just finishing leaving the autonomy with the with the client so this idea of shaving things down was, was introduced with that so over the years <clears throat> um, this minimalism I want to say, I want to, I want to understand, this is my best hopes. I want to understand how this could be useful for everybody. Um, what are some common questions that we have? And um, maybe there's, there's a, we could group those questions into, into categories. And so why would we want to minimalize? Well, for me, I, this is the idea of the conversation today is so I can teach this in a better way, make it really simple to just pass on the concepts of how we make this, how we make solution focused more simple and how um oh what's the other is in, in terms of um passing it on but also making it easy for me as well and so that the clients can learn what i'm doing in that sense as well so can i i'm going to throw it in the chat i'm going to stop sharing can i just ask you in the chat what are some common questions that you um Use what are the most common questions that you would use um, in a solution focused session? Right in the chat. What are your favorite questions? What do we got? Yes. What's been better? What's working well? How would you know if today's conversation is useful? These are the Steve's question that we watched. What else? Absolutely. Do you know I've had experienced counselors that I've worked with in workshops you know, 30, 40 years of counselling and the what else question is revolutionary <laughs> to them. They're like, wow, what a good question. You get so much more when you ask what else 10 times. <laughs> What's better? Good. Who else would notice? That's a good, those are questions there. What did you notice about yourself when things were going well? Exception sort of things, yeah. What did you do to contribute to that? Good. Agency. The how to. How did you do that? How did you do that? Good. And it. How did you manage to do this? Good questions. All right. So I'm, I'm curious now. When, and this is the thing. When, it, when I'm watching some of these live sessions that I've been watching as well, is to have a little tick box of 
how many times they ask this question. I was watching a um a session with Elliot Connie actually a few a couple of weeks ago, and he must have asked what difference would that make thirty times. It was almost like the only question he asked <laughs> kind of thing. In in a sense, what difference would that make was a really big question that he asked over and over and over again. <clears throat> <laughs> yes, we, you have to wait for the UK session, I think, for that one, <laughs> and it. But I, I, I got they're from the UK, and um, yeah, I, I had them on there, and I think I've got permission to share them. So, as well, there's four videos. There is that one that was the couple that's on YouTube that when they're arguing and she asked the miracle question. That one is it's called irreconcilable differences. Um, it is on YouTube. That one. All right, let's share again. Go back to my screen. So over the years, people have come up with these ideas to simplify um, the ECF approach. So this is one you might have heard of the museum or the house illustration. You walk in the main door, you're asking best hopes. Then you do some resource talk, or and then there's a miracle question. There might be scaling questions, and then there's the ending of the session. And um, within that, there's all these questions that I've written down in, in this picture that I developed a few years ago probably about four or five years ago that I did this when I was learning this because I needed something to hold on to. Um, and that was, that was, that was helpful. And then I, um, the, um, Elliot Connie, the solution focused universe, they've come up with the diamond and there's a book coming out last year on the solution focused diamond. And this was kind of, again, an attempt to simplify things around finding a best hopes, describing those best hopes, whether it's in the past, present, or future, and then closing the session. So the diamond is, a, for me, a very simple way of approaching it, but it still doesn't give you what kind of questions we're asking in that um, description. This is another version of the diamond that I just put together based on a little bit more information, presuppositions, change or transformation in terms of that developing that best hopes that preferred future into a description whether you saw that in the past and you described that in full detail whether it's in the present what you're currently doing and the resources that you currently are uh, using or else it's the tomorrow question suppose tomorrow you your best hopes become a reality what is it that you're going to start to notice and what else what else what else and then closing again that autonomy of the best hopes. So what I then threw out there, and this is the favorite questions, which we've already done, jumped a slide. What are the most common questions? What questions do you think are helpful and what else, of course? So that's kind of where we're going with this one. So these are the questions that I've come up with that I thought summarize all the questions we mostly ask. There are difference questions. What difference would that make? Is the first person noticing questions. What would you notice? And then you're asking, what would others notice? That we could also take that responsibility. How did you do that? You know, what what did you contribute to that change? How did you how did you notice that? And what difference did that make? Again, asking those sort of questions. There's a legacy questions that are um, part of the. And if we're just grouping these questions, where did you learn to be that kind of person? Who taught you that, you know? Who in your past have you noticed doing that the best or something is a is these legacy questions. And then there's the versioning questions. When that version of you, that best self, or the presence of the best hopes, when you're most confident, when that shows up, what do you notice? What do other people notice? What difference does it make? And those questions kind of repeat themselves over and again. And then scaling questions, same sort of thing. It's just like it's like a miracle question in a sense, too, on a scale of one to ten, where you're most motivated or confident or dealing with your grief. <clears throat> um, where are you? And what makes it and if they say a three or a four, what makes it a three or four and not just a two? How did you get to that? How did you do that? And then of course, where um what would you notice when you're a five? those sort of questions in terms of scaling. We're real, getting to the real nuts and bolts of just the simpler, simplifying these questions. And then with all these questions, you can ask what else, what else, what else, what else? So I put this into a chart and I can, I'm can i going to put this into the chat in a second. 
that looks like this. Grab that file, open it up. What would be added to it? What would you, how would we simplify that? What would be the minimalism ideas around this, the, that file there as well? So if you can discuss that for a bit, I'll just go for about 10 minutes. Someone want to share what they got out of their conversations? <clears throat> absolutely scaling is here to stay because that says scaling is interesting too because that fits if you think of that diamond of the past present future we are the presence of that you can scale any of those as well you could scale in the past you could scale in the present and you could scale in the future so on a scale of one to ten where you were more motivated back in the past what were you Good. So for the recording, I'll just read out your comment, Joe. As a newbie, it's great to see experienced clinicians using these types of questions and that it's okay to refer to them until it becomes a comfortable language. Absolutely. And I think that's the thing for me. I mean, I if I just if there's three questions that I ask the most, it's those first three. What difference would that make? What would you notice? And what would others notice? And then I might throw a scale. But then the scale has those questions in it as well. So what would you notice when you're um, you one point higher? What would others notice? And what difference would that make? The three questions that repeat over and over. And that's the thing too. I was reading something, um, some uh, research, and they're saying that the solution focus, when people have been using solution focus for a number of years, it can get stale because you feel like you're a, imposter just repeating questions over and over and over and doing the same thing <laughs> and it's like oh no so I, I have felt that sometimes okay oh i've had three clients today or four clients and i've asked the same questions of each person but the thing is i suppose i've got to realize is that every conversation is different because their answers are different um So it's a different conversation and I can go home inspired saying, wow, I just had the most awesome sessions because these people have gone from here to here and this is inspiring me. <clears throat> what else? <laughs> this is my, the um, program that I was writing in terms of um, developing solution focus. So again, simplifying this as much as I can to six lessons, little 20 minute snippets that I've been doing in a in a um, school for a staff meeting. So the first, first thing to learn the solution focused approach, the most simple thing I thought is the most important thing is the mindset. Recognizing what is the difference between solution questions and problem questions. And so, um, oh, I've got a list of 20 questions on that I have on cards or we have it on a, on a list. And it's just simply looking at those questions and going, is this a solution question or is it a problem question focused? And then framing positive questions. So how can we ask questions rather than, and I use the example of how are you? How are you is a really good question because it could be kind of, it's not necessarily problem focused, but it's not really solution focused either. Because I'm, I'm thinking to myself that most of the time when, if I was to ask, and I don't very often ask, how are you? The answer I get is a negative answer. I'm busy, I'm tired, I'm a little bit run down. It's not a very good day. <laughs> it's just that negative, it's, it's really easy to go to a negative mindset when you ask, how are you? I don't know if that's anyone else's experience. I think um, one of the illustrations of this I laugh about because when um, supermarket operators, they have to ask, how are you? Or they used to. And the most common answer I think they got from how are you is, oh, really busy. Just kind of getting through this supermarket. I've got to get home and do this and do that. And I'm busy. So busy. And then I noticed a couple of years ago that when I went to the supermarket, the checkout operator asked me, busy day? <laughs> it's almost like they, they knew I was going to answer busy if they asked that because that's the most common answers so they anticipate a negative answer in a sense so getting that 
framing like what is the best part of your day what what are you looking forward to those kind of positive questions understanding that's a really good way of promoting solution or outcome rather than problem so phase two is scaling and i think this is for me and someone said in the chat scaling is here to stay for me scaling is um the easiest way to teach someone about the solution focused approach and the nuance of saying understanding it from a solution focused perspective it's looking at potential it's keeping things positive it's it's amplifying resources rather than ne negatives and deficit um so practicing scaling is, is a really important part of teaching the solution focused approach so when we ask so on a scale of one to ten where you are um achieving your goals is whatever goal it was is 10 mm -hmm. number one and is the negative is 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 the opposite um, where are you? And they might say a three out of 10. So I then ask, why are you giving it a three and not just a two? What's got you to a three? And my my um, emphasis is on how you got there, not how you, what, why you aren't a 10, why you aren't a four. I want to know what's got you to a three. I remember a boy in a, um, it's a grief and loss situation. And when I ask that question where you're managing your grief and loss, or not and 10, 10 is you're really managing it and one is you're not and he said negative 400 and with my solution focused hat on i said so what makes it a negative 400 and not negative thousand to which he answered well i'm here aren't i <laughs> so suddenly he's on the scale and in, in, in a mind in my mind he's not negative 400 but i'm not going to dispute that i'm not going to because it's just a number and I said, what else? Because that's the most common question I want to ask. What else? He said, well, sometimes I talk to my friends about it. And what else? Um, I have some good memories of my granddad. You know, kind of that was the conversation. And then I could ask after that conversation, so suppose today is really helpful and you walk out that door and you're not a negative 400, but you're a negative 399. What would you notice? And the, again, that's a, a key nuance in the solution focused approach that I think is new. Um, it's what would you notice when you're higher, not how would you get higher? It's you you're actually you're visualizing and imagining the presence of I'm I'm feeling better today. And so when you are better, very presuppositional, when you are better, what would you notice? Not when you are better, what would have you done to get there? That's, that we that would be too much um, <laughs> task orientated. So the nuance with scaling is that, um, and it's a real miracle. And what would other people notice? What difference would that make? Where did you learn to be that kind of person? There's those kind of legacy questions um, there as well. So I'm very, very keen on scaling in terms of teaching the model because it's you can see the pennies drop when so when you say that use that kind of language with teachers when I've been doing it mostly there, even counsellors who have been doing it a while, and they go, ah, oh, yes, I can see how I could use that. It's not an assessment. It's a it's a scaling tool to amplify change. So presuppositions, again, is a really important thing to sh share and to teach for the basics of or minimalizing solution-focused approach. So presuppositions are those um, phrases that presuppose change, Fra phrases that, um, or questions we ask that assume something good. Like, so, no, so I wouldn't ask if if this was helpful today. What would you start to notice? I would ask something like, when, um, what would you? I'd say, what would you notice if this when this is helpful today? Not an if. I take that if out. I want to be as much presupposition as I can. Um, so when I say, um, what is the best thing about today? I'm not saying, have you noticed anything good today? <laughs> I'm, I'm really presupposing this, there is something, something good. What are you looking forward to is a very presuppositional question. What will you notice when things get better? Not, um, if this was somehow better, you know, it's, it's presuppositional. So real focus on outcomes is the presuppositions.
So jumping ahead, because we are nearly running out of time. It goes fast. Um, best hopes question. This again, for me, it's like I cannot imagine ever going into a meeting again, <laughs> whether it's a parent-teacher meeting or it's a counselling session or it's a, it's a staff meeting without asking a best hopes question. What will make this meeting really helpful today? What would you notice if you're talking to someone tomorrow and this was helpful? What would you um, be talking about? What would you be saying? So it's the best hopes. What is your best hopes? And I know for myself, when I've ever gone into a counselling situation or a session and I get stuck or I think I get to the end of it and I go, oh, I just felt like that was a waste of time. I was really struggling. That's because I haven't had a clear best hopes. I can I can I can tell you a story where recently I was in a counselling situation with a couple, and right near the end of this session, I have to I can laugh about it now, but I was feeling <laughs> <laughs> there right near the end of the session, the couple said, "I would like um, to have an open relationship. I we, we I really want to have a threesome in bed, and my husband doesn't want that, and." And I was like, oh, I can't deal with this. <laughs> kind of in my head, didn't say that. But I had to go, hang on, this is the end of the session. What was the beginning of the session? The best hopes was that we will remain together. And we had that topic didn't come up in the whole conversation up till that, right at the end. And so I just said, so let's just park that. We haven't got too much time. Let's focus on this idea that you want to be together. Um, and you've given me all these reasons why and what you like about the person that's got that got me out of a big hole just focusing on best hopes let's bring it back to the best hopes and make sure i've got a best hopes <laughs> so number five is working on what works this is a again i've used this more and more i've got this poster in my class in my not classroom in my office and if it's not broken don't fix it if it's working if something is working do more of it if it's not working do something different and i can ask clients now i've, I've started using this and you can do this with kids and that sort of stuff, whatever you, wherever you are. I'm like, okay, what is working? And did you see, um, if you watch that video of Steve DeShazer, he said, so you do sometimes get um, 72 hours or 71 hours of not arguing um, if you were at the opening bit. So you can do this. You keep notes around and it's really focus on what is working. It's what if, don't, don't fix that because if it's working, do more of it. So don't, yeah, that sort of stuff. And if it's not working, we'll do something different. So which one of those are we looking at today? I, I can ask in my situa counseling situation. Sometimes I do that. And then I can go, wow. Okay, well, let's make a list of what is working. What, What's keeping you guys together and what's or what's keeping you going despite all these difficulties? So asking and what difference would that make is a real key part of that. So last thing I'll go is a miracle question. Describing life without the problem versus is this is the nuance of the what solution focus like 2.0 would be more describing life with the preferred future so you saw into asking so suppose tonight the problem that brought you here today just went away what would you notice so now we're more focused on not the problem going away but the presence of your best hopes showing up and I think that's a really cool part of, of asking that miracle question. So when, even when you're scaling, you're, it's not 10 is no problems. 10 is I am really motivated. 10 is not no problems. It's I am managing my grief really well kind of thing. So there's a, that's a, there's a little, again, a nuance that I want to um, bring about in terms of doing this. And then follow up sessions, what's better that kind of stuff. So I'm going to stop there. Has anyone got anything else when you saw the um, idea of minimalism? What came to your mind? What do you think we should have talked about that we haven't yet? Maybe open for some questions. Matt, I think um, the brief people talk about all you need to know in a session is what what the what the last the last thing they said and they even reckon that once one of them one of them crumbled up with a really bad very bad stomach ache 
and the other one came in and took over and the session worked really well. Right. Because they just went on what was the last thing said and you respond to that. So mm. I think they're the minimalists of the minimalists. Um, yes. so I was saying in our, in our little group that they, I happened to be in Berlin when they, they came and, to the European Brief Therapy Conference and they came and said, look, we think we can make it simpler. You don't need miracle questions or anything. All you've got to ask is best hopes. So yep. I'm pretty sure they were the first ones to come up with that. And then someone like Chris Iverson, he is probably the minimalist of the minimalist. Do you yes. think? He yes. kind of... Yeah, he, 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 he does ask miracle questions. So, But um, yeah, I yeah. understand what... But it's a, oh, yeah, yeah. They call it a tomorrow I, I, question now, yeah. Well, well, when they said that, I think, you know, they didn't say he wouldn't ask the miracle question, but they're yeah. saying that they're looking at ways because yes. the four of them bounce off each other, three or four of them. Yes. Um, I think they're very creative, as you say, because it can be sometimes yeah. if you work by yourself, you might get into a rut. You know, when you were speaking, mm. I said, oh, yeah, I think I asked the same question yeah. six kids in a row. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's, that's good, school, yeah. good point. I, I remember, I, yeah, there's a, there's a practice task you can do where there's two circles. There's the question askers on the outside and the, and the client is in the inside and you swap every minute. So you don't know what's gone before. And I, I, I heard that it's really frustrating for the counselor because they don't know what's gone before, but the experience of the client in the middle is really positive. They go, Oh, that was really helpful just because it's based on the last thing that was said. So that's yeah, cool. yeah. 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 Okay, thanks, Matt. That's good.